STS-86 was a flight that we considered on the crew to be a rescue mission. Of course, it really wasn't, but it was fun to think about the fact that we were going to go up and rescue Mike Fall, who was up on the Mir space station. The morning of launch, uh, we check out the suits to make sure that they're all uh, capable of sustaining pressure. Here's our rookie, uh, Colonel Mike Bloomfield uh, was the pilot. Colonel Vladimir Georgievich Titov, I've flown with him twice now. Uh, this is Dr. Scott Parazinski, who performed one of the spacewalks with uh, Titov on the, on the crew. This is General Jean-Luc Chrétien, the first French cosmonaut, or spationaut as they call him. Commander Wendy Lawrence, uh, one of our mission specialists, and Dr. David Wolfe, who was going to spend uh, several months up on Mir, and he was ready to go. On the morning we walk out uh, in preparation, what we'd like to do in this video is show you something a little bit different. We'll show you two scenes, one from outside the cockpit as we're climbing up on ascent, but then we'll also take you inside the cockpit to show you what, it's, what it looks like and what it uh, feels like inside the cockpit during ascent. Mike is getting suited up. Uh, the, the folks help us to strap into the vehicle to make sure we're cinched down properly and, and tightly so that we don't uh, move. You'll see the vibrations on ascent. The morning of launch had some thunderstorms off in the distance, which you'll see, uh, but they were far enough away that it didn't impact the launch. About six seconds prior to, to liftoff, we start the main engines to make sure that they're up at operating pressure, and then the solids ignite, and you're off for the ride of your life. As the vehicle climbs, it looks like it's climbing very stately, and you see the ascent. Of course, um, um, I'll tell you that there's nothing uh, slow or stately about it when you're inside the cockpit. It's very bright. It turns nighttime into day during the ascent. And in the next scene, you'll see inside the cockpit, we're back down on the launch pad now prior to main engine ignition. You'll see it's relatively dark inside the cockpit. The main engines have ignited, and you see the vibrations in it. And right there is the solids that have ignited and you see how bright it is from the exhaust plume at the back end of the vehicle as we're climbing up. And it really is like a rough train ride as we go uphill. We had three minor failures during ascent. Here is when the solids separate from the vehicle after two minutes of powered flight. They drop down into the Atlantic Ocean uh, and, and with parachutes they, are, uh, they come down and are used again. Here's the view of the solids separating inside the cockpit after that same two and a half minutes and you see how bright it is outside the cockpit as the big cannons fire to get the solids away from us. After eight and a half minutes of powered flight, we're instantly weightless. And you see right, right at this uh, configuration, we are now weightless. We're falling around the Earth, which we'll do for the next 11 days. And it's a, an interesting feeling to go from uh, three Gs, where your, your body weighs about 800 pounds with the suits, down to zero, G, zero pounds. Uh, as soon as you achieve main engine cutoff. You see the rockets firing outside for attitude control of the vehicle. We had another failure of a jet outside, and I was a little bit depressed at the time, thinking back to my first flight uh, up to Mir on 63, where we had a jet failure, and we almost didn't get to rendezvous. This flight also was a flight where there was a high degree of uh, congressional interest because of the risk. There were questions about the Russian Mir space station that had the fire. Uh, previously, they had the collision. And here's Mike uh, firing some jets uh, during the rendezvous coming up towards Mir. And then uh, a couple of days before uh, liftoff, the Mir experienced another attitude control computer failure. And so they lost attitude control. So there were a lot of questions that we had to answer prior to liftoff regarding whether or not it was safe to go up to Mir. All of the, here's some of the tools that we use, the uh, computer that shows us the situational awareness as we're climbing up towards the Mir space station. You see the, the centerline camera that we use for attitude alignment. As we got closer to Mir, we could see that uh, the Mir was a little bit out of alignment, and our first thought was that they had another failure of the attitude control computer, but it turned out they didn't. There was just uh, an erroneous alignment that morning uh, with a star alignment, and so it was a little bit out of attitude. It was well within the tolerance of the orbiter's capability, the space shuttle, uh, to adjust the angular difference, and you can see as we fly manually up to the docking, uh, just prior to capture, you see the orbiter on the bottom and the mirror on the top, and we have contact right about there. 
and uh, for me it was uh, very professionally satisfying after two years uh, where I first went up to Mir but and, and we got within 37 feet but we weren't allowed to dock with them because we didn't have docking hardware and now two years later I finally did get to dock. I had an agreement with uh, Anatoly Soloviev, the Russian cosmonaut, that right after the handshake ceremony I, I would shake his hand with one hand and in the other hand I would give him his new attitude control computer as a replacement uh, so that they uh, wouldn't keep losing attitude control and so we, I, I shook his hand. It's a, a pretty emotional experience for cosmonauts to have visiting crew members to come up from the planet Earth uh, and to visit. They don't get to see many visitors and then here in a second you'll see here's the attitude control computer wrapped in uh, foam packaging uh, so that it doesn't get damaged and a little happy face that uh, Volodya Titov drew on outside of the box and they were very happy. We also handed them, each of the crew members handed them a big uh, jug of water that the cosmonauts need up on board the Mir space station. Solovey was shown here greeting uh, Wendy Lawrence. Uh, that evening we had a ceremonial Russian dinner up on board the Mir space station. We exchanged gifts, uh, brought the Russian cosmonauts some uh, ball caps with the Russian flag. They like fresh fruit. They don't get uh, much fresh food uh, because they only get resupplied every several months. And so we brought up some fresh food, which was uh, very good for them. They really enjoyed it. Pavel Vinogradov, the uh, Russian engineer, you see the, the state of his hair after being up in space for a long time. Uh, he had a, a haircut a couple of weeks later, uh, which is about a three-person operation, one to do the cutting, and, and the, the third crew member, of course, vacuums up the hair. This is a, a gyrodyne, a momentum wheel that is used for attitude control stability up on board the Mir space station. We brought a couple of replacement gyrodynes up to Mir. We have 12 for attitude stability. This was kind of like a, a, a business trip for David Wolf. You see him packing up in preparation for going across the hatch uh, for, uh, where he would spend the next four months on Mir doing various scientific experiments. We brought some equipment down from the mirror. This is a good system where we have the capability of bringing equipment down because we have the shuttle involved in the mirror program. You see the damage on the solar array caused by the collision which occurred uh, several months earlier when the progress inadvertently hit the mirror. We'll take you on a little bit of a tour through the mirror space station, uh, up through the docking port. It's very, it, it may look small uh, on the camera as you're floating through and there's not a lot of room to maneuver, but it's a pretty big space station compared to our little space shuttle. It takes uh, several minutes to float all the way from one end of the space station to the other. You also can get lost on the space station and so the Russians did us a favor and painted the red stripe down there which points in the direction towards the orbiter if we're on board the Mir space station and there's a problem and we have to evacuate the red stripe points the direction to go to get back to the uh, space shuttle where we would separate and, and come back down to the Earth. Of course they also have a lifeboat on the Mir space station. They use the Soyuz capsule for returning back down to the Earth if they do have an emergency, which they have not had to use, uh, but they came close when they had the collision. You see the view of Atlantis outside the um, port the window on the Mir and we'll turn around and face the main compartment of the Mir space station. Anatoly is uh, shown here in the darkness and this is where they spend most of their time. There are many cameras and many tools uh, velcroed and bungeed uh, against the wall. It, it's a, um, an area that's kind of like your garage if you had spent 10 years putting tools in the garage and never taking anything out. That octopus-like device is the hatch that they use to seal the, the uh, spectrum module that had the reduced pressure because of the collision. And it uh, showed the electrical pass-through connections to, uh, to get power from the solar arrays through the spectrum module back to, to the main part of the space station. Th this is an experiment that Mike Foley used uh, for growing uh, plants up in space and then he used the seeds to grow the second generation plant. We did a spacewalk. It was the first time that a, a foreigner uh, flew in an American space suit. 
uh, Colonel Titov, uh, Russian cosmonaut, flew in our uh, spacesuit, and Scott Perzinski and Volodya, as we call him, uh, steps out, stepped outside to recover some experiments outside the Mir space station. And here's Scott coming with his miner's helmet, uh, the lamp that looks like a miner. Uh, used to be seen in the darkness, and you see Velodya here with his Russian flag on the on the left arm. We use uh, tethers to make sure that we don't inadvertently float out into space. Unfortunately, Scott's retraction device on his tether didn't work, and so you see the long line uh, that could potentially uh, get him. Uh, tangled up, and so he had to use a Russian technique for tether protocol that we call a, a double tether protocol. Very hand intensive, labor intensive, very exhausting for Scott. But we do a lot of uh, training and weightlifting and squeezing tennis balls before a flight to make sure that the wrists are very uh, strong prior to doing the spacewalks. You see the large gray suitcase like device attached uh, to, to Scott is the experiment that we, one of four different suitcase devices that we brought back down to study the effects of, of space. Here, uh, Velodya is uh, bolting that experiment into the space shuttle in preparation for bringing it back down to the planet. Very emotional and very uh, uh, fun for the folks doing space walks to see, for example, a sunrise, which happens very quickly. This is a new sequential still video system that we use. Whenever we don't have the bandwidth capability to show movies down on the planet Earth, we can show still pictures. Every five seconds, we take a picture and transmit it down to the Earth nearly real time. Scott practiced taking out the joystick on a device we call a Safer, which is a backpack, a, a jet pack used for safety reasons in case the crew members inadvertently become separated from the space station or the space shuttle during a spacewalk, they can maneuver themselves back to the space shuttle without the space shuttle having to go chase them down and, and rescue them. We hope to never uh, use it, but if required, it is available for us to use. At the end of the spacewalk, uh, Scott and Velodya came back in to the shuttle and close the hatch uh, for the end of a, about a six or seven hour very productive EVA. As the sun sets on Atlantis, we completed uh, six days worth of docked activities where we transferred about 9,000 pounds worth of equipment over to the Russian space station. We brought a couple thousand pounds back down to the planet. Leaving is almost as emotional or maybe even more emotional than arriving for both the cosmonauts and the astronauts. Uh, especially Dr. David Wolf, who is going to spend the next four months of his professional career isolated from all of his friends down on the planet. Of course, he does have two new friends, the Russian cosmonauts. Uh, David is in the blue shirt, shaking hands behind the light, uh, taking pictures of us, and of course, the, the hugs and, and best wishes to both crew members for successful re-entry back down onto the planet. Michael Fall is ending his four-month stay up on the space station where he did have the collision, uh, a very uh, dangerous time, but was handled very expertly by the crew to isolate the leak and save the space station, and, and I think all those crew members are heroes. As we close the hatch for the final time, uh, after shaking hands with Anatoly, we prepare to separate from the Mir space station. One of the things we wanted to do was to take many pictures of the collision site to try to identify the source of the leak, to try to find the hole that was breached in the, in the hull of the mirror. And so as we separated, we flew around the mirror a couple of times and uh, took uh, many pictures to try to identify that, that leak. You see the lights here, and, and we'll release the hooks as the lights go out. That means the hooks are released, and we separate from the space station. You can see out the aft window the space station climbing up the hatch that we had just closed is now secure, and of course the pressure is inside the mirror, and, and we are now separate. I asked uh, my rookie Mike Bloomfield to fly around. Uh, this gives him some experience in preparation for his first command someday into the future. Here he is firing some jets out the of, of the space shuttle. You see the jet exhaust plume, and you see also some of the contamination on the window that we sustained during ascent when the solid rocket motors separated from the vehicle. 
As we fly around the mirror, it of course is a very beautiful sight seeing it uh, against the, the beautiful backdrop of the earth. And here are some of the still photos that we took. Uh, or, or it could be video. I guess this is video during the fly around to try to uh, see where the collision occurred. Here Mir and, and the orbiter are flying over the western coast of South America. You see some of the high Andes uh, terrain in the, in the background. Of course, if you're doing the flying, you can't concentrate on how beautiful the scenery is. You must make sure that you're the proper distance away from the vehicle. Uh, but it is a, a pretty emotional uh, thing to do, to fly up next to a space station. It's something I've always dreamed about since I was about 10 years old. And then I had the opportunity to do it. This was the second time I had been up uh, close to, a, to the space station. It's a lot bigger than it was a couple of years ago with a lot more solar arrays and, and living compartments on Mir, which is scheduled for uh, re-entry uh, into the atmosphere sometime in, in the middle of 1999. The next couple of days we did some experiments on board the space station and also prepared for entry. Uh, Jean-Luc Chrétien carried this keyboard up to Mir nine years ago and left it on board Mir. And now that he returned, uh, they gave him the keyboard to bring back down to the planet. You see our rookie still trying to figure out how to eat in space. It's, it's essential that we do exercise to get the cardiovascular system uh, in shape prior to coming back down into the gravity field of the Earth. We tested a, a computer that will be flown, uh, a laptop computer that will be flown on the space station. And we took uh, many pictures of Earth observation uh, sites around the planet. The next scene I think you'll see is a nighttime uh, view, and you see some thunderstorms, some lightning and, and in the upper atmosphere of the Earth and some of the cities down below on the, on the left side of the screen. The next scene shows our launch site at night. The city of Orlando, Florida, in the lower right-hand corner of the screen is coming into view. And right about now, you can see the Cape Canaveral site, the Cape Kennedy site, uh, where we launched about a week and a half earlier, and we intend to land there the next day. In preparation for the entry and the landing, we check out the flight control surfaces and all of the equipment, the computers and such that we need for the entry. And if you think ascent is exciting, the entry is, is pretty phenomenal. The only way to take all of the energy out of the ascent is to come slamming into the atmosphere, and it is an equally rough train ride coming back down into the atmosphere. This was a flight on the 87th, I think, landing of the space shuttle where we had the highest crosswind to date. It was the first time we got to do a crosswind landing test. We had, I think, about uh, 8 knots gusting to 12 knots of direct crosswind. You can see the head-up display, the green symbology out the window of the pilot side of the vehicle and the runway coming into view. The vehicle is very well designed by American designers and, and companies around uh, the United States and, and it handled very well in the crosswind. You can see after touchdown it does drift due to the crosswind a little bit to the right of the screen. You see the rudder uh, working as the flight control computers attempt to keep it uh, on center line and of course I'm making inputs on using the rudder pedals to keep it rolling down the runway. Mike Bloomfield deploys the drag chute which is used to help us slow down. I didn't use uh, many brakes at all until we were had already jettisoned the drag chute and we're only going about 60 knots. Just prior to the end of the runway, I'd tap the brakes just very slightly to try to save them uh, from wear and tear. We bring the vehicle to a stop uh, prior to the end of the runway and Atlantis uh, was refurbished uh, and used on subsequent flights and, and we brought an end uh, to this great flight for us, and we uh, rescued Mike Fall.